Hey, I just wanted to drop in to say thank you so much for watching this conversation with the incredible Petr Cech here on YouTube. Um, he's got so much to say and such a nice guy as well, by the way. But I also wanted to let you know that if you download right now the High Performance app, just go to the App Store, search for High Performance. You can see Petr Cech explain to us why there was nothing enjoyable about playing in a Champions League final. Can you believe that? And he also actually shares the story about how he came back quickly into the professional game after his life-threatening head injury. So check out the extra stuff from Petr Cech right now by downloading the High Performance app. Anyway, don't forget to hit subscribe here on YouTube. Back to the conversation. Well, Petr, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. What is high performance to you? High performance, like if you if you look at the... I don't know, in a in a sort of like a simple um, definition of performance, you would have the execution of an action, yeah? So if you talk about high performance, it has to be a high level execution of an action, whatever you do. So for me, it's that, you know, how well you can do what you do, you know? And, and you know, if you talk about elite group of people, if you talk about the, the best league in the world or, or any, any sport or any profession that you expect people to consistently, you know, do that action in a very high effective level. So that's for me, the high level performance. I'm so pleased that you've started in that way, because I think if there's one thing that, you know, defines your career, it is consistency, the ability to be at the top for so long. It's an easy thing to say. It's a hard thing to do. I'd be fascinated to know how you think you were so good for so long. You know, there are, there are many ways how you can go along and achieve things. But I think consistency is one thing. If you don't have, you don't achieve. Or you would have to be really lucky. Or, or you would have to be so good, so talented. Or, or the, like you would have to get some, in, in a way, some help from somewhere that it's everything falls for you yeah and and this is because if you're not consistent you're not consistently getting better you're not consistently working then you don't have the consistency in your performances therefore you you risk that you're not going to be picked you're not going to play and and so on and so on and so on so it's very easy um to start something you know you always get ideas and you it's you start, but if you're not consistent, you probably never finish, you know? So that's, that's the thing, or it takes you much longer or the, or the result is not so the same. Why did we struggle with consistency so much and how did you manage to find it? I think it's the, um, the consistency is a self-discipline. It's literally your discipline. And I think, you know, you, you always hear, you know, the people with discipline, they are the ones who actually, you know, manage to go the, the furthest because they are always prepared they are always you know trying to uh, do and you know i always see when people say you know we can we can have a better commitment you know we can put 110 percent or we can do that and i always like in my mind i always laugh because for example i think in commitment you can't really measure it you either committed commit it or you're not for me it's like two ways if you commit it you do it full speed ahead if you're not, if you're not you, you do it 60, 50 percent, and then they, they, therefore you're not really committed because then you know you can't be half committed. It's like it's almost impossible. So, and if you're committed, you you have discipline. It goes together, you know. Yeah. And and I think that's the two parts which are very important: the, the the commitment and the discipline. It just drives you forward, and therefore you can have the consistency because to be consistent, you have to do things. At the day you fancy it, the same way at the day when you wake up and I'm going, I'm not doing this today. I don't feel right and I don't want. And you know that in order to get better, you have to go and do it. So you just go and do it. And and that's that's the powerful engine which just keeps going, you know, in you. And you don't need people to be standing and saying, come on, do that. Come on, you know, run one more time. Oh, come on, do this one more time. No, you should be the opposite should be doing it and people almost telling you, oh, okay, enough, enough, don't worry, you know, don't worry. So can you give us some examples of the consistent traits that you adopted throughout your career that you feel help you maintain that longevity? You know, every day I come to work, I come to do better. Yeah, and to learn, to make sure that what whatever I do, I do with 100% commitment 
and a hundred percent attitude that you go and you think, okay, I do that. It will allow me to get better because you know, you will have days where your body is tired. So basically if that in that moment, if you're a hundred percent, it's here. Yeah. It, it can be here. Maybe another day your hundred percent will be here because your body will be tired. You know, you have a lot of games. Sometimes you travel, not enough sleep. You might, you might have a bit of flu or something like that. But even, even in that moment, if you do a hundred percent of what you are able to do at every day, it will make you better. It will still get you better prepared. It will always do that. And, and you know, every game, like if, if anybody asks me, like, I play exactly the same game and all my career I played exactly the same game if it was a preseason friendly or a Champions League final. If you put the camera on me and if you put the microphone on me, you would not find one single difference. Why? Because the consistent action every single second makes your performance consistent. Basically, the, the role of, of me as a goalkeeper on the pitch never changes with amount of people in the stand. It never changes. You know, the importance of the game. Yeah, it is important game or, or a less important game, but the role of the goalkeeper is still the same. The, my job is exactly the same. So I just got every single second in every single game with my job. And I was ignoring the score. I was ignoring the referee. I was ignoring everything around in my, in my head. And I think that was the biggest strength to keep consistent as well is that in my head, the score was always nil-nil. There is no score. Because, you know, my job was the same at three nil up or three nil down. I still need to do the simple pass as well as the catch the simple ball, as Even well as doing- Even if you mess up on the pitch? You mess up, you mess up. That's the part of the process. You mess up and just carry on. So you just get on with the next action and you just carry on with the next action. And because this is the only way to help everybody is just if you keep going, you know, you can start thinking about the thing is, if you start thinking about what you've done, that it takes you away from thinking about what you have to do. And then, of, of course, the, the biggest risk is that you, you do something silly again, because your concentration will not be on what you are supposed to do or about what you have done. And that's already in the past and it doesn't help you. So, so if you keep that in mind and you just go, so I just went along with it. And then, then after the game, you just go, okay, what a disaster. If, if it was a disaster, you feel it, you know it, but then the strength of just get the next action, right? Next action is the next action. And, and you just, you, you just get, uh, get on with it and, and you have no other, you have no other chance. Hey everyone, look, myself and Damien want just one minute of your time to talk to you about Whoop, game-changing wearable tech. And we've partnered with Whoop to offer you a 30-day risk-free trial. All you need to do is hit the link in the description to this podcast and you can make 2024 your best year yet. Whoop measures your fitness, your recovery and your sleep and best of all, it coaches you through. And we know the importance of getting feedback and consistent behaviours. Whoop helps you get both. And I think that sleep is the underrated golden bullet for high performance. I can't talk highly enough of Whoop. And if you're interested in signing up, all you need to do is hit the link in the description to this podcast. And once you've done that, you can go to the Whoop app, hit the community tab, join the high performance community, and you might just win the chance to come and join us for a recording of the high performance podcast. So sign up now at join.whoop.com forward slash HPP. Right, back to the episode. So how did you learn to be able to stay in the moment then and process triumph or disaster to be able to just follow the process? You know, when I was, uh, when I was about 12, 13, I was very um, stressed about playing a football game in goal because I had the feeling to, to concede. You know, you almost feel like an ultimate failure all the time, you know, you, you concede. So that first goal, you just go, I, I don't want to concede. I, I want to clean sheet. Uh, this is this is what it's all about. You, you're not supposed to concede a goal. You're not supposed to fail. So it put a lot of stress on me. And then I realized that I was very stressed. And then if somebody scored, that all this part of, okay, now we concede it, so I, I will not have a clean sheet, so I can just get on with it. I was 13. And, and so then... And then it started bothering me because I'm thinking, you know, 
I, then I play much re more relaxed and right. better game the moment I concede. So I was almost felt like if I put in my mind that we are one nil down, maybe it will sort of switch a little bit and I will go a little bit, you know, not, not to be so focused on not conceding rather than what I'm supposed to do. And then when I was 14, I figured out that if I just, if I just ignored the score and ignored all the stuff I couldn't control, so the referee, the decisions, if my teammate missed a penalty or big chance, in the end of the day, I realized that it had nothing to do with my job. So from that moment, when I was 14, I literally put in my mind, okay, my job, there is no score, there is no problem, there is no referee, there are no people, there is nobody watching, there is like, okay, you do your job. And, and from there, actually, my career really, I found myself in it because it actually helped me to be consistent. I had the same approach in like a match system, which started two hours prior to the game and I went through with no um, disruptions. And then, uh, and then you really find the, uh, as well the advantage of not being stressed about a lot of things. And I do it with anything I do. I still do it because the, I have a concept of steps in my mind. And I think that's something which is really important that if you want to execute something in a really efficient and best way, there are steps how to do it. You know, your computer never changes the pattern of the w whatever algorithm it gets because it knows that if they, if they do it exactly like that, they will have the best result. Yeah. So that is, it's the same, whatever you do, it has certain steps you have to, what are your steps? you have to do. So for example, if you, if you take a simple catch, yeah? So first thing, you need to be in the right position. You need to be set. You need to have hands in the right position, track the ball with your eyes, put the hands in the right position, thumb behind. So you have steps in order to have a simple catch. If you, if you skip one of those steps, you put yourself at risk that you will not be on time. And then you might fumble it. You might, you know, it might, it might go wrong. You made a reference earlier, Petra, to uh, so after a mistake or a disappointing result, when you let the emotion out in the dressing room, and I'm interested about how you go through the process then of, so after you've gone through the process of performing, how do you do the review stage after a disappointing result or performance? Oh, I watch all the actions. Then you suddenly realize that there were good actions as well, not only the bad ones, because it's, it's rarely is only the bad ones. So you can actually find lot of things there where you go, actually, you know what? There are many things I've done right. Obviously, there, were, there might be if you, if you make an obvious mistake, one or two, and then you see it, you just go, you know. But that applies in the same way in a game where you play really well, you know, because sometimes your, the score is not the reflection of your performance. And, you know, I, uh, I, I'm always puzzled, you know, when, when you see sometimes people talking about performance of a football team, for example, yeah? And then you have a goalkeeper is a man of the match, makes 10 saves, yeah? So you have these ratings sometimes if people rate how well people played. And because the team won one nil and because the goalkeeper make eight saves, whole defenders have a really high rating. And I'm thinking, how can a defense have a high rating or team have a high defensive rating when they allowed eight chances? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you lose one, if you lose one nil somewhere in a game which is not particularly looking good, and people think you you should win it, but then you don't allow any chances as a team, you play really well. People might have a little like a small rating because the outcome was not right. So you know the performance is not measured by the in the end by your person in, in performance is not measured by if you if your team won or not. The outcome. If you yeah. play really well, you play really well, and you should know that you play really well. If, if your team wins 5-0 and you are the worst player on the pitch, then you have to look at it and you go, yeah, today I was bad. So, you know, we won, I'm happy, but my contribution was not good. I think the power of the communication is really vital, right, when you're a goalkeeper. Can you explain to us how much of a challenge that is when you might have four nationalities standing in front of you? Well, I, I I went to an extreme little bit yeah, in that case. So, I um, obviously I I sp speak few other languages than English and Czech. So Which I ones? tried. So I speak French, Spanish, English, German, Czech, obviously, and um, so 
when I was giving instruction to a, a player I knew is new player, and I knew that it will be faster to give in his native language, I did it. So I would have sometimes in the games, I would use three different languages to speak to people on the pitch, just to make sure that they understand what I want. And I realized that by accident, actually, it was not something I really thought I would do all the time. But but when we, you know, when you bring new players and um, and you have somebody who can't speak English, yeah, so you have players who come, just join the club, they can't speak English, so they only speak Spanish. And then you just go, well, I, I, I'm really precise of what I want them to do. I, sometimes a one step makes a huge difference for me because if they cover that step or if they do what I ask them to do, it allows me to play the the, the whole situation completely differently than, than, um, than if I don't tell them. So I knew that if I tell them in English, they will not get it. So in a way, I was like, you know what? I, actually, I learned the specific words in different languages just to make sure that if I need it and I knew that player will instantly get it, so I, I did it. We and then it, it became a, it, then it became the habit. But when when you call an instruction which includes everybody, then of course you say it in English, everybody sticks to that. Right. But if it was a specific instruction only to one player and I could tell it I could tell them in his own language, then I did it. So what was the accident that made you realize that was the most effective way? I, I think it was in when we when uh, when I was at Chelsea we signed Asia Del Horno from Bilbao and he couldn't say a word English. So I went to Jose and I said to him, listen, can you put me all these words? This can you put me all these words like that I can use for him in that particular moment in the games because I think it's gonna help him. And as actually how I start, this is how I learned Spanish actually, because once I started learning that, then I started learning more words, and then I started, and I literally learned all Spanish after Brilliant. after that. So, Brilliant. because it was more fun, you know. Then you suddenly can speak yeah. to them not only about five words in in on the pitch or ten or twenty, then you can speak to him outside of the pitch as well, and and you understand what kind of person it is, and then it helps everybody. So, this is how, how I did it. Yeah. You mentioned Jose Mourinho there. Um, you signed for Chelsea just before he arrived, right? And I remember him arriving and all of us seeing this super confident guy in the press conference calling himself the special one from the outside like it seemed like a real landmark moment in english football i'm really interested to know what what it was like from your perspective well i signed in january and then i stayed in france till the end of the season played the euros in in portugal for czech republic and then then i then i came over to uh, to england so it was actually good for me knowing that I have five months to before I join because then I could work on my English uh, and then that was obviously a big big you know when you're in goal the communication is important for me. But then Claudio Claudio Ranieri was the coach at the time, and then suddenly I saw this change and I'm thinking oh, so this is the manager who signed me kind of, and he's not even gonna be there. So I was thinking okay what what is it gonna be like. But at the same time, you go to a new club full of internationals, huge ambition, a hugely ambitious uh, coach, and everybody starts on the same line. And I think that was actually the biggest advantage for me, because you know I came to the club where Carlo Curicini was absolutely outstanding. So you just think, you know, new manager will not really look at what players did before. He will look at them like, you know, you put everybody in, on the line mm. and you go, okay, show me what you can do. And that probably was my advantage because then I could, you know, I had the same start as everybody else. And and to be honest, I think the the um, the way Jose was at the beginning with the mentality to, you know, to uh, the training, the the approach to the games, like it was all about winning. You know, like you, you rather lose than draw. So even in his, in his tactics, when you play a home game, he said at the beginning, he said, I, I rather lose than draw. I hate draws. It takes you nowhere. So what did that do for you? So you go like, you know, if, if, we, if we are drawing at home, 
I'm gonna just put three at the back, put extra striker, and we play to win. I don't care if I lose. And and then in the end, I think he didn't lose for six, seven years, whatever it was. But does but a goalkeeper the, like that approach? Surely you're thinking, don't do that to me. To be honest, I I, I prefer to go to you know if you go to the pitch. You should not go thinking, okay, let's start and see what happens. No, because you're not in control of that. If you go there and you go, okay, we do everything to win. We take charge of it. We do it. And I think we learn how to take charge of the games. And we understood as well, like in, he was, I think in a way he said, okay, we do that. But if you have games where you know you're second best, where you know you, you're not going to win because the opponent is too good, or in that particular game, you are not good then make sure that you get something out of it, the most of it. So then we knew how to win games where we were not particularly good, but we knew we were like, we're aware of it. So we were like, okay, let's just keep going the way that we get most of it. And, and most of the time you actually found the, the winner somewhere because the approach, the mentality was there. And I think he was the, him and, and his coaching staff, they brought that mentality in. And, you know, that confidence about that, that sort of little arrogance about that, but the confidence of, I have a team which can do it, I push them into doing it. And, and he did it really well. And that's why I think the, the you know, we, we had very successful, uh, you know, two seasons, back-to-back -back titles. And, and that's why he was successful um, generally where, everywhere he went. So w I'm interested because during that time as well, you set a record for keeping an incredible number of clean sheets and being regarded as defensively the strongest team in the league. And you spoke about this mentality of having this score is nil-nil. Whenever we concede a goal, we just go back to the process. How much work did you do with your defenders I, to adopt that same mindset so that you didn't have tantrums or people pointing the finger or blame? I think we, I had a huge advantage, obviously, I played with JT there and they had, uh, you had Galas, Carvalho and, and you can, and so on and so on. You can, you can go with uh, all the players I had and, you know, there was a common goal. We actually, I think, I think we were, we, we took pride in not conceding goals as a team because you realize that if you don't concede, you just need to score one in order to win. It, it's a massive help. You know, the moment you go ahead, you feel like, okay, game, game done because we are, we are good, you know, we, we work hard, we, we are good. But at the same time, we, these people around were as demanding as I was. So it was completely normal to have an argument about a situation where, you know, you, you, you go along and you call people and you tell them what they want them to do. And they respect it because you see things better than them. But if they had something to say, well, I can't, you know, I can't do that because this guy is too fast or too good to do that, whatever, then I had to respect what, what they see as well. So we would always sort of exchange the ideas and we would do it. And then more you play together, obviously you get automatic, you, you realize each player plays a certain way and then you just go. Yeah, so it, it can work. In luck with Carvalho is at the beginning. <laughs> I have to say, it was completely special because he, it looked like uh, he's not even interested in anything. Like he was, he was there and there, and you think like, oh my god, you know, is he switched on? Is he not switched on? But then you have a pass which, like, I, I remember we played United and 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 Rooney made like a really in, interesting action and and completely this guy's pass which I was thinking like, oh God, how did he pull that one? And Carvalho was standing there and just controlled the ball. And I'm thinking like, how did he know? Like, how did he read that, you know? And he had the unbelievable reading of the game. So he had Chetty, who was the, you know, the one who was marshalling the defense, you know, very strong one-on-one, -on -one physical presence, communication, the mentality. And then he had this guy who read like every play like a book and played off him and you just go, you know, that's a strong, this is a very strong partnership. And Galas did the same, then Gary Cahill, then, you know, David Lewis, you, you bring players in and you realize how they could play well together. Ivanovic, obviously, you know, I, I don't want to forget anyone because, you know, but it's, it's always an, an important aspect is how well people connect in between each other and if yeah. they can communicate well and know how to use each other's strength and, and uh, we had a we had a team structure which everybody was clear about. 
we had the right mentality and then we had the individual players who had the you, you know big quality and we had fights every week there was somebody fighting each other in the training because there was a crazy tackle or right. there was something like that but the level of training you know the the um, the intensity of the training session it was insane i remember when um, when carlo ancelotti came so per first training session and he goes oh everybody is excited everybody wants to show and i said to him today was not a good session actually the intensity was not as good and he was surprised because he said well you know the intensity was insane and that was the key to success as well because the trainings were like games people were competing for spaces competing to get into the game and and you know and that was uh, that was actually really important to how was that to be culture like that. created because uh, there were people listening to this that work in business and they would love a culture where people really care to that level how how was that fostered it's the repetition you know if you have if you have somebody demanding that level of intensity concentration the uh, execution in every day more often you do it people get habit of doing it because you said this you have to set the standard yeah so this is where the importance is you know there's a lot of lot of times what happen is uh, like you have a new boss or, or new people coming in and they come and say this is my standard this is what i want and then two weeks later you suddenly see that you know step by step the things they said the first day it's too much effort to keep them so they don't do it anymore and then just go mm, okay so then you drop the standard you know or you know that that is not the, the real standard that you know you might say about it but the actions actually speak for itself but when you keep that going and you go and relentlessly you keep that standard and you know this is a standard nobody goes below and if somebody drops below you let them know so you talk, either push them that bit. you either push them up or you put them out if somebody really dropped the standard the manager would come and say listen you were so bad this week and in that game you don't deserve so this guy comes in but and then, that then but, then you keep the then you suddenly realize where the level is and you have no com, you know you have no complaints you can complain if you do all that and you don't get in but if your colleague actually playing in your place is getting man of the match after man of the match playing so well then you just have to go and offer yeah. play to him he just keeps uh, he just keeps his spot but can you give us an example because you use that phrase there that if somebody isn't reaching the standards you either try and lift them up or eventually you just push them out tell us about how you would give somebody feedback apart from setting the example yourself you know there's sometimes you need to speak to players you need to tell them the the, the, the things which are not um, really nice you know the reality sometimes is you know the reality is sometimes hard you just go and say okay you know you have to figure out why the person is struggling why is not doing what is not doing and then if you see them working every day and you go like yeah but i watch you for two weeks straight and everybody is doing be has a bigger effort bigger concentration push hard in harder than you in training and now you're surprised you're not picked you know this is this is not how you do it or you can't be surprised that your performance is not as good if you don't do the right things yeah. or if there is a reason for it obviously you would like to know but then this is about communication i think i think sometimes the problem in the past or in the past i would say you know we talk a lot about mental health yeah so every time every, everything is mental health now sometimes it's just the lack of uh, resilience but because sometimes when you hear the reality it can it can be hard but but the, the the reason why now like we speak a lot about mental health it's the what we carried from before you know we sort of inherited that culture where you know when i grew up you were like men don't cry you're not supposed to be weak you're not supposed to feel pain and the winners go like whoa they never have any issues you know so basically you had people who struggled with a lot of things and that anxiety maybe felt a bit uh, you know whatever it was might have a difficult time in the in the um, in in their private life they would never share the reason mm -hmm. was because everybody was like all oh, these players weak you don't put them you have to have all these strong guys only on the pitch to win the game so they would not have the confidence to to say to the coach i have a private life problem i know i'm struggling at the moment i'm trying but uh, you know can i need the help a little bit with something and they would say 
you know, I push you here and there, I give you a week off, and then you go back in. But they would not do it because everybody was afraid that if you if you say it, oh, I have pain, I have this, and I have feel, then they would not put you in. Did things happen in those days that would never be accepted now? Yeah, a lot of times. You know, the way the coach speak to you, the, the way they, you know, sometimes like laid things on you uh, with, with no uh, hesitation, like let you run uh, for three hours around the pitch if they didn't like uh, the way you train. Uh, until you you f you flop literally or like in, nowadays you would not do it you know it's a bit of a respect but as well it's uh, I think the the generation is completely different to what it was we were used to that I don't say it's good I, I don't think you know you you don't want to go from one extreme to another but at the same time I think you know you build resilience as well by putting people under pressure you know making sure that they understand that. If they don't do enough, it's not enough. You don't want to destroy people just because they have a difficult moment. But, but at the same time, you need to show them that in a difficult time, it's not a, it's not a time to feel sorry for yourself. It's time to find the solution, how to get better and how to go through it. Well, that plays very nicely into the next topic I'd like to talk about, which was a period in your career where um, you needed resilience because you were almost killed on the football pitch. Um, what are your memories of of the day when that happened? Well, I think to to my advantage that I have a couple of days uh, from my memory erased, yeah. So I don't really remember much. I, I like I, I always said, you know, I remember the dressing room, I remember the um, the stadium, yeah, the way we came to the stadium, dressing room, warm up, and then a handshake. That's the last bit because we had a handshake, and then we lost the toss. So we had to swap sides. So I remember going, you know, from one goal to another. Then, uh, then we came first time. Uh, we came back to Reading, and actually, I did. I, like I walked to the stadium, and I'm like, mm, I, I don't, rem I don't remember this. I don't remember that. I thought that there was like a different way to go to the to the dressing room and dressing room on the other side. <laughs> it was completely. So what was the last thing that you? So remember? I don't know. You know, I got I got it probably confused with some other stadium. You know, so, but but really the last thing I remember is swapping the sides after the toss. That's the last bit. But the the parts before I don't really recall. And um, and after like two three days I don't recall. To be honest, I was in the in the induced comas for some time. So. So basically, you know, maybe there's, there's a bit of a loss there. I, I don't know, you know, so I, I'm not an expert. So there's the coin toss, they're swapping sides. What's and the next it. memory? Being in hospital. How many days later? I don't know, probably, well, uh, the, the honest thing is that I kept losing memory. Eh? So basically I woke up, everybody explained to me what happened. In 15 minutes, I couldn't keep up anymore, so I fell asleep again, woke up, couldn't remember anything. And I, I that's, that's the part I remember, you know, this is the first yeah, yeah. time, just before my memory came back, yeah, I remember being, in, like, it's even an absurd, I, I've, you know, if, if it's something you've never lived there, yeah, and you never, never experienced, yeah. you would never really feel that. But, I, you know, imagine you were on the, on the bed in the hospital, and the doctor keeps coming and ask you your name, people around, the, the day, the month, the year, which country you are. And it's something you know is the exact, the, is the easiest question all your life you knew the answer. And suddenly he asks you and you go, uh, uh, like the simplest question. And you couldn't answer. I couldn't answer. I, I didn't know. I just couldn't recall anything and then that was the that was really the moment where you just go whoa you know and then the memory came back and i was thinking like oh thanks god like i've got like i feel normal now yeah. you know with the memory but you're, coming you're sort back. Of smiling when you tell that story but i can only imagine this level of fear you would have had at that moment it's a, you can't really describe it's a co complete confusion because when you hear the question you know you know the answer you just can't tell anything you just suddenly can't recall anything right. and suddenly it feels like that part is jammed. You you don't know what to say, and it's like the easiest question is you how what's your name and where you, do you know where you are? What country? What year? What date? And you just go, oh, I I, I should know, but suddenly you don't. And and then uh, you know when the when all the memory came back, it was actually a kind of a sense of relief, thinking, you know, that the most of the, you know, I remember my wife 
because then she was there every day with me sitting next to the bed. So that was the easy, you know, because you see her every time you, I woke up, I was, you know, she was there. So then you just, you know, you get the, that memory back. But then I think the biggest chunk of the memory came back when all the team came to visit. You know, when people walk in the room and you suddenly go like, oh, uh, I, I know this guy. Oh, that's Drogba. Oh, that's uh, Sheva or JT and, and all the other people. And you just go, oh, now I remember this guy. So that, that was the biggest part when you suddenly start getting things back and then every day it got better and better. And the incident, I don't recall. And I think that the, was the biggest advantage for me coming back to the pitch. Yep. Because, you know, you have people who have a car crash and everything, and they remember the moment where it happened. So there was some angle, they, the car was in some angle, the other car hit them, yeah? And so every single time you drive and, and that angle kind of occurs, they, they will be like, ooh, that's the moment, yeah. you know? I, I don't have, I never had that because you don't really remember diving and getting, you know, kicked. So, so I was like, I could see it on the video, obviously, but in a way, when I, when I came back on the pitch, I, I, it never crossed my mind. Because it, famously, Jose Mourinho at the time was very angry about the challenge from Stephen Hunt, I think it was, and he then directed his anger at the ambulance services that had came to you. Was that not an emotion that you identified with? You know, I tried to look at this different way. I think there were moments where I felt like, why, why it happened to me? And then in the same time, I just go, okay, what, what does it change? I need like the good thing what changed and you always need something bad to, to make a good change sometimes. And it happens in a, in a human history of the, of the, of the history of the humankind all the time. You need sometimes something bad to happen that people come together and find solution to, to make a better protection. So for example, you know, the, the requirement for the Premier League was not to have the ambulance at the stadium. So that's why there was this delay. And that caused the biggest issue. So since then, obviously, you have the requirement, every Premier League stadium has the paramedics at the stadium. You've seen in the past 10 years how many people got saved at the stadium, not only players, but the, but even the fans in the stand, thanks to the, the fact that uh, the paramedics are there. So that changed the rule and actually make everybody safer. So in a way, it's, um, it's a good thing. Yeah, so, so let's, you know, it's, it's, it's always something bad has to happen for that, uh, you know, for something good to happen too. I just felt like, okay, I just want to move forward. So what, what kind of uh, I didn't like was when everybody just kept asking about it. You know, you just go, well, I've said, I've said enough, just let me move yeah. on. You know, you have a saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So in, the, in that case, actually it worked pretty well and, and you need to look at this sometimes this way. And, and, uh, and I have to say that in those situations, you have two options. Yeah, so you either look at everything as a problem or you look at everything as a challenge. So every time I face the difficulties, I don't see it as a problem. I always see it as a challenge. So basically, you know, the, the, um, the doctors told me, I said, listen, forget the season. You don't play. We'll see how everything goes. If you can come back, you come back. If you can't come back, you know, you do something else. But let's, you know, let's forget the season. We, we concentrate day by day. And then maybe, you know, if you fit, ready to go, you jump into preseason. And then you go like a from you know from like a restart the season after, and and I was like you know what I'm gonna do everything I can, every single day, to go, and give myself a chance to come back, and then we will see where it takes me. And I said to him, if it takes me ten months, if it takes me five months, if it takes me two years, whatever it is, let's let's do it and see where we go. And that was the. That was the best part because I just went day by day and, and second, and I think very important part was that, um, with the medical team, we, we sat down and obviously there was challenge, you know, when you have a, like a knee surgery, you, you know, pretty much how it goes with the, with the brain, uh, obviously it was completely different because. I had days where I couldn't do nothing. 
I literally, I couldn't do anything. Like I woke up in the morning and, and I couldn't get out of bed. Like every slight is of noise, every movement, every activity just killed me. I just couldn't, like I was literally lying and, uh, and I couldn't do it. But then there were days where I could do like almost what we planned for the day plus next two days. We put the plan day by day with my head injury and, um, and they said, okay, you make the choice. If you feel you have enough, you have enough. If you can't, you can't. If you can, you can. And this was exactly what was happening. I told them, we carry on, we carried on. If, when I said, like, sometimes we started and I said, guys, I have to stop. And they said, okay, fine, you stop. But then they knew because they knew I pushed myself to the limit. So they knew that when the moment I said, I can't, they were, they knew I can't, mm -hmm. like I always have that. And what, what was a great um, learning process in that moment for me was that I was getting signs from the brain where, I, where it had enough. So I had always the like five minutes prior to complete like a switch off, I would have my eyes sticking like that. So here you could feel that was going like that, the eyelids were going. So the moment my alley started going, I knew that I have five minutes to stop and rest, drink, eat, or anything. Otherwise, it would it would. What would happen five um, minutes after? I would just pass out for fall asleep. Really. And so this this is where this is where the control was very important. Yeah. And this is where you, this is where I learned actually how to listen to to my body because once I ignored it and I pass out, it's not a good feeling. So then I was like, okay, if next time that happens, I don't ignore it. And and then it obviously, you know, went better and better. So I could do more time, more days, more guys in a row. And and as well, in that moment, I started making notes about the days. Yeah, because sometimes you have a, you know, your emotions take over and you have a bad day, a bad day, and you just go, oh, it's going nowhere. I have bad days and it's, I'm not never going to recover like that. But if you make notes of the good days, bad days, and you look at the bigger picture, then you just go, oh, hold on a minute. Last month, I had six bad days, one good day. Then it went to five uh, bad days and two good days. And now I'm actually three bad days, for four good days. So you suddenly go, you know what? No matter how it feels, yeah. how bad it feels, or it feels slow, I'm actually doing really well. And I think in the end of the day, I think the closest are the ones who suffer the most. It's not, it was not really me. You know, I, I had in my mind that I do everything every day to, you know, to get there. And there's a bit little light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, I go there closer and closer. And, and that was my, you know, in my mind, but they were the ones who saw me flat out and, and uh, yeah. tired and, and uh, not, not the same. So, I think they were they were the one who, who suffered the most in yeah. the end. Uh, when was the injury? What month? October, November? It was October 14, 2006. Six, yeah. And they said, your season's over. How many months later did you return? I played, I think it was about like 107 days after the surgery. So oh. three. So, so you needed, I think by, so the 12 weeks, the first 12 weeks is where you need the skull to consolidate. So the bone to get back to, together yeah. to, to, to heal. So basically the doctor said, whatever you do, you can't do anything for 12 weeks because it's literally impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, they will not be fit, strong, even to think about yeah. doing anything hundred percent. So the, the first months I was learning the little things and, and I was going over all these issues with my brain. Second month I started training like physical training on my own. The third month I would play tennis. So I had the helmet all the time, uh, all the time I had the helmet on. And uh, that was the only circumstances. He said, well, uh, we can't let you, that you can't even slightly touch anything. So you need to have it. So you have to do it on your own. So I was playing tennis most of the time, training, working in a gym, running, doing things on my own, like uh, throwing th balls of the wall, small balls, but not high. If, if I missed it, it, it never hit yeah. my head. So things like that. And gradually I, I felt so strong. It, you know, I was working, working, working was, was, was my go-to thing in the end. So I felt so strong. So when after 12 weeks, 
the doctor said, actually, now you you might think about going into trainings where people can shoot the ball at you, because now you have the you have to keep the helmet, but the bone is fine. It's, so it will never be as strong, but but you know you have the helmet, so it should be fine. So then then I said, okay, let's go. So I went to the training, but I was so physically fit that I felt like you know what. I can do that. So I went to training, did about two training sessions with the team, and then we went to Liverpool. And then uh, and then Jose asked me, he said, okay, do you want to play? And I said, I mean, you know what, if I travel, you know, let's go, I, I go. And then uh, then I played. But so there was the decision which I made, obviously, you know, they, they were saying, you know, take your time, it might be more difficult, whatever, but I just felt that I was ready. I felt that for me, the best thing to do. When we went to Liverpool, I went home. I said to my wife, well, they want me to travel to the game. And she said, oh God, I heard that before. She goes like, are you joking? So so I said to her, I said, no, I, I, we haven't decided yet whether we, I play or not. And she said, I know you're going to play. When did you make the final decision to well, play Well, the moment I decided game? to travel, I knew I, I was going to play. The feeling when you made that first save or touched the first ball or contributed? No, you know, I made a good save. There, I made the, some somewhere at the beginning was this, I made quite a good save, and and I felt like you know what, I'm I'm fine. the The only thing which I underestimated and which I never really thought was the helmet, because you have covered you know partially your ears and and the back of the head. Yeah. So although I've, you, I was never really aware of that that much because you don't really think, yeah. But you have receptors on your skin, on your hair. So when somebody's standing behind you, you actually feel them, no matter how, like you don't yeah. really think about that, but you actually, it helps, you know, you sort of have that feeling like something's there. But when you have the helmet, you hear a different way and you, even that, you know, you don't have the same feeling. So, you know, you always have to kind of like scan more a little bit. So I had to learn that, but then you play one, two games and, and I got used to it. And then I never really, you know, then you just go along with it and it was fine. So you went through a period of many managerial changes, quite a lot of upheaval at Chelsea, um, probably a lot of uncertainty for the players. Also, there was a period where you were constantly getting close to winning the Champions League and fell short again and again, including you know, the famous penalty shootout. What should we talk about first? The the ability to deal with all the change or the Champions yeah. League? When I started playing, I was 17. I signed my professional contract. I played for Khmul Bashani, which was the small team in the Czech League. Does not Sadly, doesn't exist anymore because it's a, literally a village, so they couldn't sustain it when uh, there were changes of the ownership and that. So then, obviously... So I started there. And then uh, then I signed uh, for Sparta Prague when I was uh, when I was 18 or, or 19 and everybody was saying why is Sparta Prague buying this guy he has no chance to play but we had a new coach and then the first three games were they didn't really happen well so the fourth game of the season the goalkeeper coach came to me and he said to me you know I think the manager is going to put you in play an away game so be prepared for it so we played an away game in Opava. I went there and we won two one. I played really well, and then I then I stayed in in goal. We went nine hundred plus minutes without conceding, broke all the records of invincibility, number of clean sheets in one season, and all that. Played twelve games in the Champions League. Actually, beat Mourinho in his first game it, as as a Porto manager. Uh, he played the first game uh, in the Champions League at Sparta Prague with me in goal. We won two <laughs> nil. <laughs> but um, so it it kind of went this way. Then I went to then I went to European Championship under twenty one. We won it in penalties in the final. I went to France and then from France I came to I came to um, to Chelsea. But what I learned there is that it doesn't matter how how many people are there in you know you competing with. Ultimately, you compete with yourself. If you can be the best version of you, if you can train as hard as you can, if you can show everybody around that you are the person to to pick, they might have a different strategy at the beginning, but they can't keep ignoring it in a way. Yeah, no matter what it is, like everybody has the common goal. You want to win, you want to have the best people around you and you want to use the ones who perform the best that your common goal 
get achieved, no matter if it's a company, if it's a football team, school group, wh whoever you know you think. So I learned there that it's not ultimately about who is who you're competing with. It's about showing everybody that you deserve the go, that you are prepared, you are there, you're ready. And as well, when you're ready, if your chance come, the possibility that you take your chance with both hands and you not, don't let it slip yep. is when you're prepared. Because a lot of times happens in the life where people go, oh, the manager doesn't count with me, didn't put me in. And then you don't train properly, you don't do things, and suddenly he puts you in, you're not prepared. And you have a worst game ever, and they go, okay, this guy's out because, uh, you know, I give him a chance and nothing happened. So you let your life slip through your fingers because you're not prepared. So I was always prepared. And every day I prepared. I train as I was playing. Yeah. And I'm always like, okay, if he puts me in, I'm going to show him I'm the guy who can do it. And that I did pretty much with every single manager of change. Because I was like, if the coach see me in training, being the best player in every training in terms of the attitude, the commitment, the, you know, the consistency, he will put me in. Like, there's no way the, the manager will ignore a, a quality like that. We can't stop talking about Chelsea without talking about the the Champions League win. Talk us through the timeline from your perspective of getting close time and time again and whether you ever had that fear that it wasn't going to happen. You know, we were in, um, in five semifinals, then we lost the final and then you always close, always close. And then you almost feel like this trophy is kind of, you know, avoiding us. It doesn't, for whatever reason, you know. But then in 2012, as I said, you know, I said to my wife in December, I said, you know what, this season is going horribly wrong. And, um, but then everything in the Champions League is going, like actually, you know, we manage. Every, every time, you know, we play the Champions League game, we sort of get there. We get the results. Like we couldn't get in the league, but... So I said to her, I said, this, this, is gonna, this is gonna be ironic if in a season where we can't get anything going in the league, we actually finally managed to, to do it in the Champions League. But um, so I had that you know, weird feeling that we, was we will get somewhere, but you never really think in the moment you have a bad season and things are not really going well, that you would win it. You know, in the back of your mind, you go, you know, well, you get closer, mm, you survive another game, okay, then you survive the Napoli comeback and you just go, mm, then Barcelona, like if you go down to 10 men at Barcelona and you go to nil down and you ask anybody on putting the money on Chelsea going through, you just go, everybody will tell you that you are completely insane. So we, we against all the odds, we end up in the final and, and you end up, you know, the, the, the irony is that you end up in the final playing a team who was the best in Europe at the time together with Barcelona and um, playing the home game in a Champions League final in front of their home fans using their own dressing room and having pretty much 80% of the fans on their side because obviously all the, you know, you have a big, a small portion kind of like for each set of fans, but it's German in Germany. So most of the sponsors who, who get to get the tickets obviously gave it to people who had some connection to the, to the game, you know, in Germany. So it was pretty much all of them Bayern fans. So, you know, we know when you walk out and you, see, you walk out and you see everything red and just this blue part behind the goal, you just go, ah, oh, this is, this is a proper away game. So if you, if you look at the script and you think like, they have it all like that in front of their eyes, you know, like literally just to take it. But then again, we, we went and we said, you know, against all the odds, we ended up in the final and then we can, we can actually do it. And we had so, so many problems going uh, to the final with injuries. And we, we actually had three lineups. People don't know, but literally ahead of the warm up of the game in Munich, we had three different lineups. And it was like, if this guy goes and survived the warm up, this is the lineup. If this one survived the warm up, this is the lineup. Wow. If neither of them can, this is the lineup. So we had about five people warming up, not knowing whether they actually playing or not. And and then in the end, uh, they all played. I think David Lewis with Gary Cahill, they were the two who didn't even know if they're gonna go through the warm up. And that that's why we had so many variations. Even going to the warm up, we still knew that one of these three lineups can actually happen. And any time in the game, they could break down if they're that. At any moment, to... they could get injured. Any moment, 
You know, I think then how, like literally they couldn't walk after the game because, uh, but then you go with the adrenaline and with the, the, the importance of the game, you just go through it. So fair play to them, they they managed to even to last 120 minutes. So amazing. You story. know, it was a, so this 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 shows again the the you know the mindset, the resilience. If you don't have it, you can just say, oh, I'm not 100. percent But then you need to choose. But I think you need to choose wisely as well. Like there's a fun, fine line between, you know, being brave and stupid. I always say that, you know, you have to be brave to push your limits, but you can't be stupid. So if you know you injured, you know, you can't do, hun you can't perform, you will harm the team, not only yourself, but even the teams. And then you have to make the conscious decision to say, I can't perform. I play a year and a half with broken shoulders, both actually. Before I had the surgery, I had it for 14 months, like broken labrum, couldn't lift my arms. Nobody knew. I was training, I was playing, I was doing everything. And every single time I dived and made a save, I had tears coming like that because it, it was a terrible pain. But you just, met, but I knew I can perform. It was right. the two back to back titles, actually. So then you just go the second year, entire year, and you just go. You know, you just go, okay, I, it was probably not the wisest thing to do, but at the same time, I could perform. I had terrible pain every single day, but I could perform. So that was the thing. If I couldn't, and then I reached the point where I couldn't lift my arms anymore, I said, listen, I played the World Cup with it, and then I did the surgery. So then, but then you need to make the decision whether you say, well, it actually stops me from performing, yep. or you go. And halfway through, I was thinking, what should I do? Like, should I just carry on? And should I, and then, you know, as I said, it was a World Cup year. We were back to back title. I was still playing well. I think got the golden glove in the end of the season as well. So you just go, yeah, I can perform. But the pain was a disaster. Chelsea buy Courtois and decide to sell you. You're at your peak still. I mean, you went and you were still goalkeeper of the year when you joined Arsenal. So actually when it's a really big thing like that, do you allow yourself this feeling of a sense of injustice? You know, the, you, you need to look at the reality as well, yeah? So when, when the first, like, we started training and you go through the preseason, you go through the games, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, they have no reason not to put me in a goal, yeah? So if, it's, if it goes really with that, there is no real reason in terms of the performance, the preparation, the preseason, everything. But the reason was one thing, you know, you have a, a guy with huge potential who comes back to the club, everybody else wants him, and he has a year and a half on his contract. <laughs> and you go like, if you don't let him play, he's not gonna sign. So. You know, I was sitting there and I'm thinking, of course, they will they will go and say, okay, you go, you know, and give him a chance because that's the only way how to sign and show him that, you know, he has a future. And to be honest to him, you know, the team started winning. He played well. I played seven games in that season. I had six clean sheets. Pretty much won everything. A part of one game against Bradford, I think it was a disaster. We lost 4-2 at home in the FA Cup. I don't know how, <laughs> but we did. But um but the rest of it, like I played, you know, in a, like really in, on the top of the game. So I was training every time I get a chance. That almost I, makes it worse though in and, some ways. No, no, like, but then you show the manager, you said, listen, you know, I'm there. I'm always ready. But whether, whatever happens, you know, you just show like, I, it's a, it's a, it was a pride for me as well to show like, you know, I'm not going to throw the toys out and, and just show you that I'm upset. And then we won a title and it was really good. And then you just go, so now they have no reason to, to change him. Why would they, you know, why would yeah. they do it? He's 10 years younger than me. So you look at that and I'm thinking, okay, that's me done actually, because I'm, I'm not going to play 10 games another season when I'm on the, you know, on top of my form. Why would I do it? And at the same time, I wanted to stay in the Premier League. I wanted to stay in the Premier League. So I had plenty of offers to go abroad, but if you if you want to be the best, you want to compete with the best, you stay in the best league. So I said, uh, this is where I actually went to speak to the owner. And I said to him, you know, I have three offers. One of them is uh, uh, like potentially Arsenal. And uh, although it's a, it's a rival, I want to go there. And um, 
and he he didn't he didn't look too uh, too happy about that. But because of all I've done in eleven seasons for the club, then he said, "Okay, I will let people know that." you make your choice and you make your choice so you chose where to go so i i in the end i said well i'm going and this is my preferred you know yeah. destination i want to do it and then uh, you know you know joseph was not happy about that and i know that if it was in a different circumstances probably it would have never happened i don't think they would How allow me well if i didn't if i didn't speak to the big boss and and literally he didn't out of respect he didn't let me go it would have i don't think it would have happened the question I've been looking forward to asking you most is about one of the most central figures of modern day football, Arsene Wenger. And I'm intrigued as having somebody that went to him after you made that decision to move on from Chelsea. What was your experiences of him? You know, with um, with Arsene, you know, it's a, like you see managers with different approaches, but Arsene was one of the people who actually, you know, believe in people's talent. Like they, they, you know, when you come to Arsenal based on some scouting, based on what you can do and how you can do it, he likes you to use that, you know, to express yourself and use that. It was a different approach in a way, you know, because it was, it was like when uh, most of the managers, they would say, okay, use your talent, but this is a structure. You have to do this and you defend here and you do that. But, but he, he almost said like, you, of course you had the structure. If you would have done that, you wouldn't do that. But he really makes sure that the player it's in position and do and in in the place where they can express all all the talent and quality they have and that's why the football reflects it as well because you have this nice fluid you know the arsenal way it comes it comes pretty much from that that people you know use the football qualities to you know control player play technical way the and, and and it was actually you know a di different different approach what I've what I had experienced like to to a certain extent, and and I enjoyed it. I you know I think uh, with his with all his experience as well as uh, knowing the club uh, upside down, you could see he make huge impact uh, in there. And at the same time, you know they they went through some difficulties when uh, when Emirates was built. Obviously, they had to pay. The Emirates Stadium off, and and then he had to deal every year with selling the best players to to pay the stadium off, but yet still being top four and and performing and playing good football. So, you know, I, when I like one of the reasons I wanted to go there, it was um, it was the challenge to bring him back the title. Mm. That was something I looked at and I was thinking, you know what, that's actually my aim. You know, get it there. They were in the Champions League final, lost it. You know, if he can get, if if he can get that, that was my motivation. Like going there to say, okay, these are two trophies they, they they don't have. It would be actually brilliant if we can if we can do it. And and it was in the moment where the club, you know, started being in the, again in a strong position of being able to bring players because of the the stadium was paid and. And you you feel like okay that's you know that could be actually a, a really uh, you know nice challenge and and I really enjoyed it I have to say. And did you feel for him the way it, the way it ended? I mean I still look back on the criticism that that manager got and think how did certain sections of supporters not see quite what he'd done for them? I think you know when you when you have a huge passion and you want the club to do well and. And um, you know, it, 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 it you always close, and you don't jump the last hurdle. You almost feel like you know the players were changing, but the, the the manager was not. So maybe the last hurdle will be the the manager change. Mm. So I think that some people felt about it like that, and and you know, it's 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 really unique if you have someone over twenty years in the same club. You know, to be able to do that, you need to be really, you know, you need to, you need to have an, you know, special circumstances in a way as well, and and maybe that, you know, longevity after a while came to some people to say, oh, I always see the same managers, same style, same this, same that, so maybe it just came to the point where people felt like, uh, you know, some changes needed, but then, you know, but it's the way you express it as well it can be, a, it's the way it's done. So some people took it really in a in their hands like that but um you know in a way uh it, it, you know i think 
retrospectively, everybody realizes how much impact and how 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 big importance Arsene Wenger plays in in the history of the club. You know, from the from the Invincibles, the titles before, all the way, you know, the Champions League campaign to the final, where they were a bit unlucky. And then you just go, you know, like build the stadium, the training ground. So, you know, he, he, he left a huge legacy. Let's talk about your departure from Arsenal and how quickly you went straight back to Chelsea. But I was amazed that one minute you were a player, the next minute you were in the sort of the boardroom senior management team at a football club. Why was it so quick from finishing playing to wanting to go back to Chelsea? You know, that it was actually uh, the circumstances, yeah. So when, uh, I think when Michael Amenala left Chelsea, he, um, th- there was this job which was there at the time. And um, I, when I, when the last game, uh, you know, I played the last game in, in Baku, came home and I was thinking, okay, I take a week where I don't want to hear about anything anywhere. And then uh, let's see what comes. Yeah. But then, uh, uh, but then the, um, I had, uh, I had the call before or like a month, even before I decided uh, that I'm not going to play anymore. So he was, I was still playing. And, and the question was, how long you intend to play? Like, uh, you know, we would like you, we would like you back at some point, at some posi- at some stage, but in terms of the planning, you're like, what is your, and I said, no, I'm, I'm a player. So that's, that's it. Don't, don't, you know, I'm, I can't, I can't tell, but obviously that then when I finished that, uh, the week after I took the week off, I, I got the phone call from Chelsea and they said, listen, so this, this job is there, but if you don't take it, we need to, we put, we have people, you know, you, you compete with in terms of, in terms for the position. So you, if you want to try, if you know, you know, you come or somebody else, we need to think of somebody else, but then, and then I was sitting at home and I'm thinking if somebody comes, does well, then this chapter is closed almost. And I'm thinking, am I in a position to let this pass or I have to take it? And I'm, you know, you think you go, it's a big step. It's a completely different job. It's a, a huge learning process and fast, you know, nobody gives you too much time to, you know, you just kind of jump in and swim. But with all the education I have, the all the studies I've done, you know, the MBA, the, the, you know, the, the, the coaching badges, the understanding of the football club, seeing it at Arsenal, seeing it at Chelsea, seeing it like as a player, seeing like, I, you just go, you know what? I, I think I can give it a go. I could play another two years, but I was not fit. And if you, if you feel like I, I knew that maybe I would not be able to train hundred percent, I would not be able to play hundred percent because of that. And I'm, I don't like that. You know, I either do everything hundred percent. I do not, I prefer nothing or close to hundred percent or nothing. And I was not sure I can do that. And therefore I was like, you know what? I, um, I, I prefer to, to end it like that in my, on my terms almost, and to get around my head around it rather than getting uh, injured halfway through the season and, and saying, oh, sorry guys, I need to. I need to retire because uh, I'm, I'm injured and I didn't want to do that. And was it hard for you to go to a manager who, when you were a player, was the boss, right? You're suddenly having to go to a manager and say, what you're doing isn't right. Like the way this uh, is going isn't correct. Well, luckily, I, the, the managers uh, I had was not, not anybody who would be coaching me. So he didn't feel weird. He didn't feel strange, you know? And, and so I think you? the nice part, like for example, having Frank as the manager, was actually a good part because you have this, uh, you know, I know him from a different perspective too. So you can, you know, you, you, you have that both sides of the, of the, of the coin. And we had always like a mutual respect to, you know, as, as players. And then obviously you work together. So you try to make sure that, you know, we, we get it right. Because I think he cared a lot about, 
uh, you know, coming back to the club, he, he knew he got a big opportunity to come come back very early in his, uh, you know, coaching career. So obviously, we, you know, he really cared about making it work, and we obviously we, we all really desperately wanted for 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 him to work. You mm. know, Frank, when we interviewed him and we spoke about his time at Chelsea, said that in hindsight he stopped communicating upwards when things started to unravel. He started to become more focused on the team rather than communicating upwards and from your perspective seeing that what did you do to feel you could intervene or help him or mentor him no we always we always talked about it because you know you need to you need to always find um, the right balance yeah and um i think in my position you kind of you have to help the, obviously the first team as much as you can but at the same time you represent the club so you need to make sure that whatever's done it's not against what the club vision is what the club tries to achieve so you sort of go and think okay uh, you know what 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 is the what does the manager want how visible he wants you to be and so I always went along with that. I said, I always said with them, and said, okay, how visible you want me to be? Right. Of course, I have to do my job. And my job is this, 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 and that. But if you prefer for me not to be too visible, that it feels like I'm, I'm kind of like uh, always supervising, then fine, you know, you tell me, and then and I do that. So so the, this, you need to always, you know, think of the balance between- So what did Frank what say the, to you then when you asked I, that? I think, you know, Frank with this, uh, with the, he, he wanted to make sure that uh, when uh, when he's with the team, that the team knows that, you know, he's the, he's the, he's, he's the boss, he's there. He's the, he's the main guy to, to, to deal with the players and, and um, so I, I would be, you know, when, when I, I was around, when we said, well, "Okay, I'm gonna be around because I need to watch whatever," and if um, if he, he said, "Well, today I prefer, you know, there is not too many people watching. I would like to have like the team just concentrating this and that," I wouldn't, I wouldn't go. What so that's, that's the that's that's as I said, it's you know, you need to have that you know way of uh, making sure that you don't compromise your job, but at the same time you make people feel okay. I I prefer to be like that, and then they they just do. You know, their job, yeah. And what about your relationship with Thomas Tuchel? Well, th th how was that the same and how was it different? You know, Thomas, because he's German, he's used to having the sport director on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> so he was used to it. So he goes like, you know, you do anything you need to do. And and uh, and I said to him, well, you know, I actually enjoyed, you know, being around because I feel the, you feel the vibe of the, you know, the training session, you feel the vibe of the players, you, you, you have that, you know, energy. And of course, you you know you're not there every day because you have other stuff to do mm. too. But at the same time, you you know I, I I like that, and I think he he was one of he said you know I always like to you know to to know your opinion, and 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 so we you know I was I was always around, which was uh, like a it's slightly different way, but um, but as I said, it's it's more like how you make it work the best for for everybody. Yeah. I think that's the most important part. So. You let you know you need to as I said the main part is of course you you do your job you do as as best as you can and then you find a way that other people feel comfortable and and they can do their job as best as they can. What would you say was the difference between winning the Champions League as a player and then winning it as part of the leadership team? You know, it was more satisfying winning it actually in uh, in my second role. I, I I don't know why, but. But um, well, I know why. Because the um, you you know when you are in the team, you know that's the team, the people who are closely working with the team, the coaching staff, medical staff, the people you see every day, and you sort of never you don't, you don't really think too much about all the people in the offices, the people who cut the videos, watch the do the analysis, the people who scout go around go you know the secretary who deals with every suspensions emails tickets i don't know there's millions of people who who works around you know that you have that success overall so when you are in that other position you you sort of feel the happiness for all that because we sometimes like as a as a as a football player 
you underestimate how much pride, happiness, and joy the people who are behind the scenes and practically unknown to everybody, a part of the team, you know, how proud they are when you win it, how happy they are when you win it. So then you imagine all these people who work every day behind the scenes, almost invisibly, but so importantly, then you just go, you know what, all, all these people are happy, including you, you know, I was not on that pitch, so I can't tell I won it, but I, you know, when you build, when you sort of help to build the team, it, it, it kind of puts the process in place where everybody feels comfortable and the, and the manager can do the job and everybody else can do the job. It's satisfying. I have to say the satisfaction for, for far greater in in that moment because I realize how how many more people actually we made happy. So yeah, when I look at your CV, it says you won one Champions League, right? It should say two, no? It's fine. I I, I in know. Your head? I I know. I in my head, I know. I was a part of helping it, and I take. But you know, ultimately, I'm, I was not on the pitch. So yeah. I'm, I think it's rightly that I'm not. It, I don't have yeah. two because uh, I was no, not was on the, the pitch. So, would you tell us about the process of choosing to leave Chelsea then? Well, you know, there was. Um, we we all know there was a lot of changes. You know, we had, uh, you know, with the with the difficulty of uh, of the sanctions, the difficulty of of uh, changing in the circumstances. It was never, you know, if you have a if you go through a transition or change of ownership, which is planned and prepared, then of course you plan and prepare for it. You you know the timeline, you know exactly in which circumstances and what will be happening, and you can, you know, you plan with it. You know, you have discussions about. You know the, the the future plans. Your discussion, how, what, you know, you have that. If if if, if it happens, the in the circumstances it happen, nothing really prepares you for that, and and then things are happening sometimes very quickly, and and you uh, you end up in the situations where you know you discover how, you know how things might work, uh, how it's gonna be, what is the what what's the new vision, what's the new plan, what's what anything. And um, you know, as I said, uh, as I said, I did. You know, the way uh, the way I I am, the way I do things, is that I have to believe that I'm hundred percent into the case of like this is this is what I do, and I'm hundred percent in it. This is where we go. And um, and I have certain ways of doing things, and and I I believe in them. And uh, so when when you have a lot of changes and then suddenly you you know you have that feeling like okay that might be too many changes to you know to fit in or to uh, to simply take part of it like with a hundred percent commitment uh, I thought like you know what maybe you know maybe when you have when everything changed maybe it will be actually beneficial for everybody if people choose their own people like you know what i mean like you come yeah. as a new owner you can you can choose the people you want to work with and you have uh, and you probably have the people who feel like 100 person in it and and i felt that you know i i felt that it, at the moment it was like probably the best for everybody would be if i if i'm not there the new owners they wanted me to stay right. but it was my decision it was my decision to go and and I said, well, I know I, uh, this is what I want to do. And I think I believe it's the right decision for, for me and for everybody. And, and as I felt that I'm like that, and, and that's why I did it. You still feel it's the right decision? You know, I miss my work, actually. I have to say, you know, it's, uh, you know, it was, it, I really enjoyed it. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I don't regret it. You know, that's the, that's the part. Yeah. I think I made a decision. And I and I uh, I do other things now, which make me grow as well as a as a as a person for the future. I have time to finish my coaching badges. I have time to finish my PhD uh, thesis. I have I have time to you know to other to spend more time with my kids. At the moment, you're lost to football, and you've got so much experience, so much knowledge. You've gleaned and learned so much. Do you do you want to get back in? You know, I would say that if the right opportunity and at the right time comes, yes. 
And um, because, as I said, I, I really enjoyed it, and and of course, you know, football will always remain a big part of my of my life, of my passion, and as well, you know, I would like to share the knowledge I I gained during my uh, career as a player, and then you know, in in those three years in in the opposite side of playing field, but um, you know, as I said, it need to be. It it would it needs to be always uh, as I said uh, in a, in the circumstances where you feel like okay this is a right project this is a nice project this is really worth investing all my time and and energy and 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 in which position and how you know I I enjoy coaching for example that's something I really love I, I can actually see myself coaching wow. because because it's one one thing which I really you know when I look at games. I, I always look at the strategies, the the space, the you know the plays, the how other you know managers do different things, and and I always try to think you know uh, what would I do in that situation, how I would I do it, would it work, would it not work, you know stuff like that, and yeah. and um, so that's that I have to say it's it's something I. I uh, I sort of enjoy. That would be the headline people now take from this whole conversation. <laughs> Petr Cech wants to be a manager. Look, Petr, it's been a really, really interesting conversation. We finish with some quick fire questions. The first one is, which three non-negotiable behaviours do you and the people around you need to buy into? I think first would be definitely the effort. Because like, if you, if you don't put the effort in anything, then you don't even start. Yeah? Yeah. So... It might go together with this commitment, like you either committed or not. So if you commit, then, you know, and the attitude, how you do it. Because if you have the commitment and if you have the attitude, then you have the discipline as well. So it comes all together. But I would say the effort always comes first. Yeah. Like if you can't put the 100% effort and the commitment into the case, I don't think you get too far. So the three were effort, commitment, and attitude. attitude. What advice would you give to a teenage petter just starting out? I would, um, I think the, the, the advice I would give applies to anything. It's to make sure that you don't waste a day of your life because the life is too short to waste it. And if you want to achieve something, you need to use every time to, you know, to, to do meaningful things to improve yourself or your position in in whatever you want to achieve. If you could go back to one moment in your life, what would it be and why? You know, as 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 many things as happened to me during the life, good things, bad things, I always say I wouldn't change a thing because um, I, I, you know what, I would, I would go back into that moment when we won the Champions League, you know, that feeling, the great feeling of achievement, satisfaction, chasing the trophy for so long and, and being so close and yet so far many times. And that, that's the ultimate best feeling you, you yeah. have. So that's probably, uh, yeah, that, that, that's probably one because you, you you know that 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 joy was was special, but uh, but as I mean, you know, there are many things you do and you look back and you think, if I could change that, but it may it might change the way you are after, and you might not have achieved, you know, the, the other stuff. So as I said, you know, as with good things, bad things, I wouldn't change anything. What's your greatest strength? What's your biggest weakness? The greatest strength, I would say, my consistency, the 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 discipline and consistency. That's that's what uh, drives me every day. Because there are many things I don't like to do, but I know I have to do them. I do them. <laughs> so, so I would say this is my this is this is the um, and the mental strength in terms of being consistent with my emotions as well. The final question, Petter. What's your one golden rule to live a high performance life? The consistency, yeah. <laughs> Again, the I think is the inner engine. Because if you have the inner engine, you have the consistency and you have the discipline, and then it allows you to to improve every day. Peter, honestly, thank you so much. Thank you. Enjoyed that, man, immensely. Thank you so much. <laughs>